Thank you. Um, it's been very interesting listening to the presentations uh, throughout today. Uh, as I said, I work with the Maritime and Coast Guard Agency now in the health and safety team as the behavioural safety lead, bringing a little bit of what I'm going to talk about to, uh, with you to the Maritime and Coast Guard Agency here in the UK. Hopefully you'll be able to see how um, the aviation industry has handled some of the issues that you've been talking about today. Uh, my uh, connection with aviation started in the mid-90s, aged 14, when I had my first flying lesson, and uh, ended in 2020 due to that little global thing that we had going on, making my employer um, cease trading. And that's when I found myself looking at um, how I could share the knowledge that I've gained over 26 years in aviation and bring it to new arenas. So that's what brings me here today, and I'd like to start with a question to the room initially be a little bit too easy to ask you to play spot the difference. So I'm going to ask, spot the similarity. What is the connection between all of these that you see on the screen? Pardon? Cargo? Well, they're a type of cargo. Transportation, cargo. Carrying passengers. Oh, we've got a hand at the back. Navigation. Navigation, yeah, yeah. These are all great connections. We've got two hands over there. International regulation, International regulation. Everybody yeah. Everybody who drives them is called a pilot. Yes. So that is. <laughs> well, would you be surprised if I said the connection in my eyes is that these are conceived, designed, built by humans, <coughs> operated by humans, regulated by humans. Every one of these vessels has a crew on board, and every one of these vessels has a captain at its helm. So when I first started flying in the 90s, we very quickly were taught about how aviation's laws and regulations and uh, rules, principles of, of navigation, stemmed from the maritime sector's heritage and history. Alongside learning about the technical and the legislative elements, pilots are taught to consider how we as humans play a role in the safe and effective operations, and this is taught as human factors. Human factors is the foundation principle of a concept called crew resource management. And it's incorporated into training from the very start, with an examination in the principles of human factors being required as part of your private pilot's license, the license you need to just fly a light aircraft for pleasure. That continues through your airline transport pilot's license, which is 14 examinations required to act as the captain of a commercial airliner. And as I said, that is the foundation piece for the rest of your career when you are talking about CRM. An understanding as how we as humans interact with each other and are impacted by each other and the environment within which we find ourselves. professional pilot's career, knowledge of human factors is continually refreshed and intertwined with the CRM of the small and very interdependent teams on board an aircraft, combined with that fast-paced, critical environment, means that learning and application of human factors within the aviation sector has vastly outpaced other sectors. In the aviation world, you, well, in maritime, you have the IMO. In aviation, you have ICAO, the International Civil Aviation Organization. And Annex 19 of their documents focuses on a guidance on safety management, which includes implementation and requirement for a just culture within the whole of the aviation sector. It encourages open and honest reporting to share lessons learned and to prevent further occurrences of incidences. As with most regulations and laws, there is a history and tragedy uh, as the SOLAS Convention came about from the Titanic, uh, aviation's most deadly disaster actually led to industry 
focus on the human elements impacts of safe operations. All pilots are taught about the incidents that shape the way we work and we think. The importance of good teamwork and safety culture in the airline industry is embedded at every stage of training. I'm going to talk about some air crashes here, so sorry for any nervous flyers, but hopefully you'll learn that uh, we learned from them. Um, so the first one that really is the starting point of crew resource management in the aviation industry is uh, 1977. Two Boeing 747 passenger aircraft collided on the runway in Tenerife in poor visibility. There were 583 lives lost and it remains the worst aviation disaster to date. The captain on board the KLM aircraft was the airline's most senior instructor and he was the literal poster boy for KLM appearing on the posters for the launch of their jumbo jet. The first officer and the flight engineer on board had uncertainty about their clearance to take off and yet they were hesitant to raise their concern clearly to the captain to stop the takeoff roll. This was an era where captains were regarded as master and commander of their ship. They were always right and their judgment was never to be brought into question. Had the crew made a more clear statement to stop, that disaster would not have happened. This was the very first accident to include human factors as part of the investigation. The findings contributed to the establishment of <laughs> It highlighted how command gradients within the flight deck could affect safety. Cockpit resource management drew attention to the importance of the cockpit crew working as a team with a collaborative approach to team decision making. Less experienced crew members were encouraged to challenge their captains when they were uncertain on something or they believed something was incorrect, not sitting right. And captains were instructed to listen to their crew and evaluate decisions in light of crew concerns. All pilots, no matter how experienced they are, are allowed to contradict each other. And CRM teaches ways to raise challenge effectively and to receive challenge effectively. Captains were no longer considered infallible. 12 years on, from the Kegworth air disaster, saw cockpit resource management become crew resource management. In 1989, a Boeing 737 crashed whilst attempting to make an emergency landing at East Midlands Airport in the UK. A fault with an engine meant that the crew chose to shut it down and divert the aircraft for an emergency landing. Sounds scary, but it's something that all crews are trained to do. It is a standard emergency procedure. The investigation of the incident identified a variety of human factors which ultimately contributed to the aircraft crashing short of the runway. Fundamentally, the pilots shut down the wrong engine. Ooh. <laughs> the pilots throttled back the working right engine Stop moving. Um, instead of the malfunctioning left engine. And they had no way of visually checking the engines from the cockpit. And the cabin crew did not inform them that smoke and flames had been seen from the left-hand side. The cabin crew assumed the flight deck knew what the problem was, knew what they were doing. Captain's in control, he'll know what to do. And the pilots did not consider to include the cabin crew's input in their fault diagnosis. This incident highlighted the historic divide between the flight deck and the cabin crew when considering the crew. Focus on an integrated crew as a source of information for decision making and emergency situations became part of the CRM evolution. 
The first evolutions of CRM training focused on topics such as briefing, strategies, situation awareness, and stress management. Specific modules address decision-making strategies and breaking the chain of errors that ultimately leads to catastrophes. By the mid-90s, CRM began to be extended to other groups within airlines, including flight attendants, dispatchers, maintenance personnel, and shore-based resources. Many airlines began to conduct joint cockpit and cabin crew CRM training. A number of carriers also developed specialized CRM training for new captains to focus on the leadership role that a company's command. The message of modern CRM is it made the newest, most junior person on board that aircraft that spots a problem first or holds the key to solving it before it becomes too late. Captains are expected to enable an onboard environment of team working across ranks. We're now perhaps seeing the next evolutions of with the concept of collaborative resource management. So we've gone from cockpit to crew to collaborative. Looking beyond our vessel for an answer, drawing on support from other agencies and including them in the problem solving and resolution elements where, where appropriate. I think a good example of this that demonstrates aviation and maritime and shore um, actually happened in October last year when a yachtsman, an, uh, an American yachtsman, got into difficulty 650 nautical miles off the, coast of Northern, off the coast of Ireland. He lost his mast and the e alerts were picked up by His Majesty's Coast Guard at the Joint Rescue Coordination Centre in Faroe, which is only about 10 minutes down the road from here. Search and rescue coordination occurred and assets from the uh, were deployed. They were able to locate the yacht and drop survival equipment to him. Merchant vessels picked up the sailor and took him to safety. This is an example where thinking beyond his vessel saved his life. For airlines, the training and assessment of CRM is now a mandatory requirement and it's incorporated into training at all levels. Annual refresher training provides a structured approach covering the required elements of firefighting, security, aid, and CRM. My previous employer had a triennial program, so over the space of three years we would cover various elements of human factors, stress, fatigue, um, the safety elements going on in the industry. And the key takeaway with these um, lessons were that it was learning from other events across the world, other airlines, other crews, sitting down and discussing how the human factors affected it, what decision making happened. And it's not just the people on the aeroplane, it's how the operations the crewing, the uh, program management, the scheduling, all impacts the events on that aircraft on the day. But how do we assess CRM competency? We well, heard the term earlier, soft skills. I hate the term soft skills, I use human skills, technical and human skills. In aviation, 70% of all accidents are induced from pilot error. Lack of communication and decision-making being two contributing factors to these events. The NOTEX system, non-technical skills, provides a method of evaluating effectiveness of CRM training in the actual work environment with a structured approach. Within each category, elements are identified with behavioral examples provided to assess positive and negative demonstrations, with either an acceptable or an unacceptable score for each section. NOTEX assesses and provides feedback on the social and cognitive skills to help minimize pilot error and safety in the future. 
application of the NOTEX system has been incorporated into airline simulator check flights and training with instructors and examiners being able to observe behaviours in simulated high pressure environments in critical periods of operations. Over the past 20 years, alongside the evolution of CRM, technological advancements, which we've been hearing a lot about today, have created new opportunities and associated challenges for the aviation industry. With the introduction of new technology, awareness of change management and how we train our crews to use the new kit is critical. 1990s training aircraft, modern day training aircraft, big differences. Cadets are being trained to be airline pilots with expectations to move from flight school into the right hand seat of a passenger jet as opposed to going and flying some pipeline surveys or parachute dropping exercises or being a flying instructor to build that experience before entering a commercial airliner cockpit. Cadets now are more used to iPads and touch screens, sat navs and automation than back in my day when it was clockwork dials. The training aircraft are now more representative of the equipment a cadet is likely to use in an airline. The layout and working practices are already familiar as they step into the employment from training. Traditionally, cadets would be post-university age. I was a bit of an uh, anomaly back in the 90s when I chose flying instead of university. Now that is the norm. We are seeing 18 and 19 year old cadets entering the flight deck at 20 and 21 as their first job, their first experience into the world of, of work. This in itself brings an interesting shift in workplace dynamics and some interesting challenges when it comes to those human factors of working together effectively. Flight training has needed to evolve to match the modern flying environment and the equipment standards. In 2004, I, along with many others, was uh, somewhat skeptical about the concept of increasing simulator time in place of actual flight time. But the argument was that simulators were evolving and the, uh, it was more affordable, provided the opportunity to practice and simulate failures that it wouldn't be safe to replicate in real flight. Across the world, across the world you could hear flight schools and flight decks saying the same thing. There's no replacement for actual flight time. Anyone else heard some of that in, in the maritime sphere as well, I'm sure. And you know what? To some extent, that is true. But with one very important caveat. And that is that it's not the hours in the logbook that counts. It's the experience gained in those hours. Synthetic training devices come in a variety of sizes and budgets, from accessible online PC-based radio navigation trainers, known as route trainers. They're now available on iPads and iPhones in the palm of your hand to practice navigating to or from beacons with wind and drift and all the other wonderful things that make your job challenging. To flat panel trainers, these are used to be able to practice flows and drills and calls and checklists between crews. We're seeing virtual reality headsets being used more, enabling cadets to wander around an aeroplane, carry out a walk round as it's known, open hatches, look inside, walk around an engine, take bits off it, look at the, mo at the parts and the equipment to see what they would expect to see right up to the uh, multi-million dollar full motion flight sims used by airlines as an immersive opportunity to develop muscle memory for drills and familiarity with new aircraft types. I have spent many hours in that box. <laughs> They've come a really long way since the early days of link trainers in the 1940s. We're now seeing the industry explore how similar technologies such as virtual reality headsets and wraparound visuals can be used to remotely operate drones, as our last presenter talked about, or even air traffic control towers. 
How many of you knew that London City Airport is now remotely operated from near to here? The tower is just a load of cameras and there's someone sat in a room with a wraparound display controlling all the aircraft in and out of London City Airport. By using a range of trading devices, crews have the ability to see and experience new equipment and systems in a virtual environment, meaning that crews are safer and more effective quicker when joining the live operational environment. Having the opportunity to practice an engine start, pausing to review what the dials and gauges should be looking like when everything's looking good, and being able to recognize when an abnormal situation is unfolding, all on a PC. Airlines see the benefit of their crews maintaining competency and familiarity with less commonly experienced situations. Having exposure in a simulated environment on a regular basis means that when it happens in real life, it doesn't come as quite such a shock. Annually, a commercial pilot must complete a set of specified maneuvers within set parameters to demonstrate their continued abil ability to operate this aircraft safely. Flight simulators provide a cost-effective solution for airlines to conduct these required license skills tests. Maneuvers include engine failures at critical points, such as on takeoff, approaches to airports flying in cloud with an engine shut down, and missed approaches where a landing is aborted. Other operations which would not be possible to replicate safely in a live aircraft. This simulator environment provides a new pilot with the opportunity to build muscle memory, including this muscle up here. It means that when you face these situations in real life, the cognitive load, the shock of dealing with it, is reduced, enabling you to have the capacity to focus on the situationally specific elements of the environment around you. A finding in the investigation of the Kegworth accident identified the pilots had received no simulator training on the new aircraft model, as no simulator for the 737-400 was available in the UK at the time. The importance of simulators to aid crew training for new equipment was recognised in 1989. As airlines and training schools are now exploring the use of virtual reality, mixed reality and augmented reality, the role and expectations of instructors is also changing. Sitting next to a cadet, feeling what they're feeling, seeing what they're seeing, versus monitoring inputs and parameters. The way we train our trainers has needed to change. Awareness of the limitations of simulation versus exposure to reality is critical. As we explore the future of training, it is definitely an, an enhancement, but should it ever be a replacement? How airlines use simulators has evolved. My personal experience has been that there's been a shift from using simulators to practice technical drills and assess technical competency into a more holistic overview of a cruise operation. When I experienced an engine fire warning in flight in my first year as a first officer with a commercial airline, after a brief moment of disbelief that it was happening because it was a crisp, clear winter's morning, actually overhead Forley, just not too far from here, we could see Southampton Airport. This wasn't the simulator, this wasn't low visibility, this hadn't happened just as we'd taken off. The practical drills and muscle memory kicked in. Everything was done between myself and the captain. We briefed the crew, we briefed the passengers, all things that we had practiced in the simulator. We proceeded to land. And then what? In the simulator, that was the end of the exercise. It would be a case of, right, great guys, let's go and get coffee, take a debrief, we'll reset, we'll go and do something else. We now found ourselves quite uncertain what to do next we haven't got a need to evacuate. There is no fire, it's under control. Evacuating will injure a lot of people. Should we? Could we taxi into stand? Aviation has since recognized the need 
for fidelity in the training scenario. Exercises should be seen through to a natural conclusion to avoid scenarios like mine. Real call signs are used instead of simulator ones. This was a lesson learned from the British Airways crash at Heathrow in 2008, where the aircrew reverted to their simulator call sign, the one they'd always used to declare a mayday. And it left confusion for the air traffic controllers as to who was in distress. We don't have this call sign on frequency. Looking back at the past two decades, I can see how far the aviation has come with its embedding of human factors and its drive for continuous improvement through safety learning. We've seen changes in the operating environment, the aircraft equipment and technology on board, the employees' expectations of the employers, the way we as humans live, learn and work, the aviation industry has come a long way in the 120 years since the Wright brothers took their first powered flight. And I see an industry that is taking lessons from its past, but looking firmly to its future for success. Thank you. Heather, thank you very much. That was absolutely fascinating. And I'm not sure if I'm relieved that I'm not flying out of London City, um, <laughs> or if I should actually aim for it. Um, maybe it's safer. Um, question from, from the floor to Heather. I see a question at the very far back over there. Um, yeah, just uh, one question again. Um, there's a lot of good things one can look, learn from, from airline, uh, and there's also a lot of special things in maritime. Um, how far, I think one of the issues that we have never seen in maritime world so far, they have taken two different uh, um, roads. Uh, airline is heavily standardized vessels, not vessels, but planes. Yeah, I mean, there's a number of, let's say, 10 types if you look at the major airlines. Yeah. Uh, standardized, also cockpit-wise in a way, and I think we have 80,000 vessels out there with presumably 160,000 different bridge designs. Um, how far do you see that the effect of standardization, not just of the training, but also of the equipment and the product or the, the movement itself pays the contribution towards that success? I think that um, in conversations I've had since joining, joining the MCA, I've been quite surprised at, um, I'm thinking of harbour pilots specifically here, who would jump off one vessel, help get it into port, come off that straight onto another one, totally different equipment, layout, um, and that, that to me just blows my mind that they would know what to do, and I appreciate that the, the ship's captain is also there. Um, the standardization element of things, I guess when you're looking at bridge design, the, the navigation tools, the thought process is the human element that's at, at play on any vessel. We're still human and we're still looking at instrumentation in the same way. And I think that, um, I don't want to take away from my colleague's presentation because I know he's going to cover some of this himself, but if you know what to expect, it takes some of the stress away. It takes that cognitive load down so you can focus on the things that aren't standard in your environment. So I know it's not a magic bullet, but you know, if people getting onto a ship know what to expect, either through a visual um, video of the bridge or the vessel they're about to get on, which they could look at the week before they join it to know they're going to go left instead of right and this display here or the ramp trainer I identified you could have I think there's 57 ECDIS or more you know these are technical solutions that can enable people to have familiarity with their environment before they get on board which are relatively cost effective I will leave Paul to talk about standardization in his uh, sec in, in his lecture I'm happy to talk to you a bit more about how the aviation industry does it but an Airbus A319 or A320 license around the world, bar a few small adjustments, you could pick up and put a pilot in each one, send them somewhere they've never gone before, and they would know the standards, they would know the processes. Arguably, you can sit next to someone every day that you've never flown with and operate a safe operation because you know what to expect from each other and the environment around you. 
Hi there. Um, it's a well-worn trope in the maritime industry that we're 20 years behind aviation, and it's amazing to see that the MCA have got somebody from aviation um, in your role. So thank you for, for doing that. My question for you is, is about um, CRM and, and versus BRM. Just simple but also a very complex question for you. In your experience so far, what would you say is the is the your key area of focus that the maritime industry's BRM approaches um, fail to achieve, which is achieved um, in CRM approaches in aviation? Um, I wouldn't go so far as fail to achieve. Um, two different. I do appreciate the very different uh, crew complements and working environments. Uh, obviously, on board uh, an aircraft, you're probably with each other for maybe 10 hours. Uh, very fast-paced, very visible to the public, and working together very closely to achieve an operation which is condensed into such a short time frame. And I do appreciate on board a vessel for months at end with different cultures and different um, working environments, there are differences. But I think the thing that surprised me the most is those slides representing an aircraft, I was quite surprised that we are still seeing a separation between the bridge crew and bridge resource management and engine resource management. Um, that consideration of the vessel as a whole, to me, is, is fundamental. And breaking down some of those barriers, I know it's not an easy task to do, but breaking down the barriers uh, makes a massive difference. Kegworth, at that time, there was a curtain separating the flight deck from the cabin crew. But the environment had been set up by the captain that he wasn't really interested in what the cabin crew did. They were there to do their bit. He was there to do their bit. So they didn't feel able to pop their head through that curtain and go, just so you're aware, there's, there's fire and sparks coming out the left side. Had they done that, it would have been a very different situation. But the captain set that environment up where that wasn't an option for them. And I think that that's something that we are seeing a change in in maritime. Um, and it is a generational shift in the workforce of any organization that I've seen over the last 10 years. The, the new cadets coming in and flying with me were much more confident and were trained to be the commander of the vessel when they were pilot flying. So there were challenges around how they perhaps approached telling me that I was doing something wrong in their eyes. And there was some learning to be done from all the parties on how to effectively engage across gradients, across ranks. But I would say that's my key message is, it's not just on board the vessel, it's how your shore crews, your management, role model the behaviours that encourage safety reporting, encouraging people to speak up when they see something that could be done better or more safely. It's all of that. And that's not just the maritime industry. It's what I've been quite surprised over the last three years as I took for granted in aviation. It's not something that exists across the board in all sectors. So that's my key message. Be leaders that people look up to, that people feel they can approach and people can ask questions of. Because in asking questions, it might prompt innovation that actually helps your company make some significant savings or prevents a significant loss. Great, Harold. Thank you very much. I saw there are quite a few further questions. A big round of applause to you.